Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. They were willing to do what other companies hadn't been willing to do. She had no idea that I had that in me. I didn't know either. It makes you think anything's possible. Today on Spotlight, they were designed as a cutting edge housing project. Find out why there was a rent strike here in 1969. Plus, a St. Louisan invited to a dream come true event where she'll showcase her art. And then what happens to utility poles when they're taken down or replaced? But first, facial recognition technology, the scary implications of this new reality. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Facial recognition technology has quietly been growing more powerful for decades. But a company called Clearview AI is taking it to new levels of accuracy that could end privacy as we know it. This one investor said, the way that you Google someone now, I hope that one day you say you clear viewed them, you searched their face and you found out everything about them there is to know online. What Clearview AI did wasn't a technological breakthrough, it was an ethical one. They were willing to do what other companies hadn't been willing to do. In her new book, Your Face Belongs to Us, New York Times reporter Kashmir Hill unmasks facial recognition and the pioneers who were speeding down a dangerous road with very few guardrails. I think we are at a moment right now where the technology is worrisome and we need to figure out a legal and policy infrastructure for it to make sure that kind of we get the best of the technology and not the worst. But this goes back like to the 50s or the 60s. Yeah, there were engineers working on this in Silicon Valley before it was even called Silicon Valley, and they were getting funding from the CIA. This has kind of been a dream for a very long time to be able to identify a stranger, you know, put a name to a face, put an alert on someone's face and spot them in a crowd. They've been doing this for a little while and it's getting a little, little spookier yeah, <laughs> by the day. Uh, yeah. So the book started for me in the fall of 2019. I got this tip, an email from someone I knew, a public records researcher who had discovered the existence of Clearview AI in a public records request to the Atlanta Police Department. And, you know, there was a legal memo there. It was marked privileged and confidential. And I'm reading it and it's describing what Clearview AI has done, that they scraped billions of photos from the public um, internet from social media sites like Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn, all of our photos uh, without anyone's consent. And they were selling it to hundreds of police departments. And I, like you, had never heard of Clearview AI before, even though I work in this area. And I thought, wow, if this is true, I need to get to the bottom of this because this is really wild. It's different in Europe, right? In Europe, uh, when I exposed the existence of Clearview AI, privacy regulators announced that they were investigating it, also privacy regulators in Canada and Australia. And they came to the conclusion that Clearview AI had violated their privacy laws and that they needed to get citizens' consent to you know, gather all of these photos, um, subject them to face recognition searches. And so Clearview AI, Clearview AI is not doing business anymore in, um, in those countries, but still doing business here in in the US. Well, and the fact that they have those privacy laws, why don't we have one in the United States? That is a great question. And a lot of activists ask that question. And I try to track that in the book to tell this story about specifically face recognition technology. And I've, I, you know, mark all these moments where policymakers, activists, uh, technology companies have kind of gathered in Washington, D.C. to talk about this. And sometimes they're just really strange political bedfellows. You'll have Dick Armey, you know, very conservative politician, teaming up with the ACLU in 2001 after face recognition uh, technology was deployed for the first time at a big event at the Super Bowl. The Snooper Bowl, I think this you refer to it. The New York Daily News called it the Snooper Bowl. 
And they were really upset. And they said, you know, technology like this can really threaten our civil liberties. And people shouldn't be just tracked this way. You, you're, you, have, a, you have a right to privacy in your face. Um, but then September 11th happened. And instead of pushing back against facial recognition technology, there was a push by the federal government to make it better, to deploy it in airports. Um, and so there's just been this constant push and pull between privacy and security, and so often security wins out. To find out what you can do to protect yourself and get your face taken out of their database, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis. The Wendell Pruitt Homes and William Igo Apartments were designed as a cutting-edge housing project. Public historian Cecily Hunter explains the impact they had on residents and the rent strike that ensued in 1969. Pruitt Igo were 33 high-rise buildings. It was developed as a new design model that was supposed to address public housing in St. Louis. It was also designed to marry racial relations, joining both black and white community members together. Pruitt Igo would open its doors in 1954. And in 1969, residents would join forces with other public housing tenants to address inadequate living conditions. So Darce Webb, Clinton, Peabody, Car Square, Vaughn, and others as well. They kicked off the rent strike, which lasted about nine months. Essentially, they were addressing many different issues that was causing the community anxiety around not getting their needs met from maintenance. For Pruitt Igo in particular, there were different things like the trash incinerators were not working. The running water was causing issues, whether it was cold or too hot. The elevator would often not work, as well as mounting rent hikes. And so they were constantly contributing money to being able to stay in these facilities that were not necessarily meeting their needs. So many of the tenants pooled their money together, actually drawing those funds that they were initially contributing to the St. Louis Housing Authority and saying that we're going to withhold our rent money. And so they nearly bankrupt the St. Louis Public Housing Authority because of withholding that money. And so ultimately that nine month stretch, they would receive some of the things that they fought for. So they wanted to make sure that 20% of their income would go to their housing, but nothing more. They also wanted to make sure that their maintenance items that were not necessarily being taken care of were taken care of. Police protection was another thing that they also advocated for, among other things. One important thing with this rent strike is that it's through this national recognition that even some of the politicians were actually beginning to think about ways to address the issues that many face throughout the country. And so Edward Brooke actually contacted Jean King, who was one of many key organizers here in St. Louis, and essentially created legislation called the Brooks Amendment to the Public Housing Act of 1969. And that essentially set forth a plan moving forward to help address some of those inequalities though we know that these things still continue to be an issue today. Next on History Spotlight, how the Hill neighborhood played a large role in the appearance of St. Louis. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Florence, Italy, the birthplace of the Renaissance and the center of artistic works from the 14th to 16th centuries. Masterpieces by Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and Botticelli are among the genius celebrated drawing tourists and inspiring artists from around the world to visit the Tuscan city. Florence has also been host to some of Europe's most important galleries and exhibitions called Biennale. For 20 years, 
The Florence Biennale has worked on promoting the development of contemporary artists like St. Louis native Aaron Ballinger. I can't believe I've really made this happen through all of this other stuff. Like, it just doesn't, yeah, it's awesome. The invitation-only event is a dream come true for Bellinger and a chance to showcase her pieces before an international audience. I've just always wanted to be an artist. I think creating is like the coolest thing that we can do. I really, it's limitless. There are no rules. I mean, to some people that sounds horrible. To me, that just sounds like, oh my goodness, that's a way to make magic. At first, Bellinger didn't think her invitation was legit since she was contacted through social media. So she reached out to her childhood mentor for advice, former Clayton High School art teacher, Russell Vanisek. He looked at me, he looked at me, he's like, wow, that's really good. And I was like, oh, that's funny because I don't feel, I don't know what I'm doing. He's like, well, it looks like you do. So. <laughs> she was really worried about her, the quality of her work and also the consistency of the work because most of this stuff is pretty new for her. You know, and I said, well, they called you, you know, you had to show them your work, so, you know, go for it. Vanasek himself showcased his contemporary artwork at the Florence Biennale two years ago. And so that I knew that, you know, getting into these Biennales was like a big thing in Europe. And it was really set up for people were gonna go around and see who were the best. 70 countries are represented at the exhibition, which is housed in an old fortress just outside the center of the city. Very few American artists are chosen from the Midwest, let alone two from the same city and with very different styles. Both Bellinger and Venisek's love for drawing began as soon as they could hold a crayon. Photography and painting portraits were their interests before venturing into other mediums. Vanisek gravitated towards depicting nature, specifically birds, which he showed in Italy. His use of texture has proven a unique and profitable niche. Birds are always moving, and they're always making sounds. Um, so I kept putting that into the work sort of as a metaphor for how, you know, birds live and act and how we see them. I'm not saying I've been through the worst stuff, but I've been through a great, nice, just a little bit of everything, physical illness, mental illness, like a lot of different things, and it's made me a survivor. Now a wife and mother, Bellinger says her work in various mediums is all about using her talent to help others heal. And to put that on a canvas is like, I know, I'm getting chills because it's just like, it makes you think anything's possible. That fits in with this year's Florence Biennale's theme, I Am You, individual and collective identities in contemporary art and design. There's a lot of work and emotion and life experience and just me that goes into these things. It's about having blind faith that people are gonna connect to these things that aren't even living, you know? But they have, you're, you have brought a life to them. Among the four pieces she's chosen to show in Florence is what she's entitled, Empath. And an empath is more like my personality type, very, very sensitive. And she, has come out of the darkness with a smile on her face because she's come out stronger. There's the businessman. Trauma brain in bloom. That's the bloom of trauma for me. That's what it looks like. That's what it feels like. And a bronze sculpture she calls resting in pieces, each revealing a piece of her in them. I'm grateful to have the experience and to like not be in pain or sick and like be able to enjoy it. We're here at the Florence Biennale opening day. Everything is absolutely amazing. Here we go. Uh, right here is in bloom, uh, the empath, see-through soul, and the businessman. 
Bellinger knows that Florence Canali could be a turning point in her career. And what better inspiration than being surrounded by history's greats? Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. When you drive down virtually any street, you'll see utility poles alongside the road. In fact, they're so common, you probably don't take much notice. But what happens to those poles when they're taken down or replaced? Folks always ask me, what is the lifespan of wood poles? And the, the blanket answer is somewhere between 40 and 50 years. We have them out on our system today that are 40 to 50 years old, and they, you know, they've been tested and they still meet, those still pass the strength requirements. Regardless of the reason, not every pole makes it to that half century mark. Poles are replaced for a number of reasons. The biggest reasons that stick out in my head are Mother Nature. And obviously everybody knows we live in the Midwest. We have a lot of storm damage. It could be straight line winds, could be tornadoes. The other reason is, is just end of life. That's no small number of poles that need to be changed out each year. And each and every one undergoes a number of other checks first. Ameren, Illinois has approximately 1.3 million power poles and nearly 9,500 multi-pole structures. And we cover a 43,700 square mile service territory. Every year we replace about 10,000 poles. Right here, this will show the, uh, the inspections that's been done on this pole. It gets a visual every six years and then it gets a full ground line every every 12 years. So basically what that means is on year six, they go out there and they look at everything from the ground up. They're looking for loose hardware, uh, the pole tops splintered out, all that type of stuff, possibly a, a burn insulator. Um, and then on year 12, we could do the full dig 18 inches down. We look at the wood around there, look for decay. We do a series of measurements and there's a whole algorithm that figures the strength. Previously, when we put up a new one, we'd bring the old ones back to the yard. They'd be in a pile similar to this, and basically they would go to the landfill. Um, what we've done is we've partnered with Blackwood Solutions to get them, they, they use the word recycled. I like to use the word repurposed. Just because a pole doesn't meet our strength requirements to put power lines on doesn't mean that there's not other uses for it. What they do is they try to get with church groups, baseball organizations, park districts. They could be used for parking bumpers. They could be used for fence posts. Like I say, there's a wide variety of stuff that these poles could still be used for just because they don't meet our strength requirements to put power lines on. We just want to be stewards of our environment. We don't want to see the, uh, the landfills get filled up and we feel that that's really doing a good justice to serve our customers, uh, looking out for the future of you know our kids, our grandkids. Um, if we can do our part and everybody can do a little part, it'll all help us out in the future. Jazz and RV performer Katara Parson, later on Spotlight. Hi, my name is Jordan Scott Gantz. I'm a hard edge abstractionist. My work is about translating nature and the natural phenomena onto hard edge abstraction, utilizing line, color, and geometric forms along with wood to echo the natural world. My New Mexican upbringing has been a big influence on my creative process. I value the light, the landscape, and the vivid hues in the Southwest. This exhibit has new work that I've been working on over the past year. Some of it has monochrome colors to it. Other ones just have bright colors that interact with each other. Some of the colors will cause an optical illusion, which causes the brain to guess what it's seeing. So there's hard edge colors that I use that will start looking like it's wobbling or moving. I hope you can see this work in person because of the optical illusion effects that happen from the paint. It never works as well on camera versus the human eye. A viewer will see these centered, bright paintings that are basically right in the center of what appears to be raw wood. The wood has been treated with graphite, and the reason is to echo the natural world. And wood has special grain, kind of like our fingerprints. So that right there, you can see it's an original piece and not a reproduction. It was important for me to interact with the natural world through the wood grain and put the human touch in there through painting. And also my paintings are so precise that it is a technique that I believe lends itself to almost machine-like quality. However, I love the fact that it's the human hand in there. 
I'm excited to be here at the Dwayne Reed Gallery for my first solo show in St. Louis. I'm originally from New Mexico, been living in St. Louis for 10 years now. I hope you have the time to sit with the work, be with the work, and let the work speak to you. What does it say to you? The show will be up until December 2nd. And you can learn more at DwayneReedGallery.com. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. So my name is Katara. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, born and raised. Well, sometimes I go out by myself and I look across the waters. Every day. Sunday after church, you know, they got to congregate and talk and I would be so bored <laughs> like, mom, come on. And like we had this brown upright piano in my church and I would just I just went up one day when I was like seven or eight and I just fiddled around just like this, just these four fingers. And I discovered I didn't know what it was then, but seven chords, like different chords. And it just kind of came together like puzzle pieces that just made sense to me. Flash forward a couple of decades, and self-taught pianist and composer Katara Parson has gone from killing time on the church's upright to earning an 18-month jazz residency at the Kranzberg Art Center in 2019. Her unforgettable voice and unique blend of classical influences with hip-hop, R&B, and jazz made Katera a standout in the St. Louis music scene. But for a long time, playing and writing music were the only pieces of life that came together easily for Parson. I grew up in Wilston, one of the most neglected, um, violent, abandoned parts of the city, grew up in poverty, corner liquor stores everywhere, and churches, ironically. And that was my norm. My mom sheltered me, kept me in the house, because, you know, growing up in the hood, like, you know, you had to stay safe, keep your children protected. So I think her sheltering me kind of molded me into this hermit, and that's how I started making music. Like, uh, I would be cooped up in the house, secretly composing stuff, and I was too afraid to put it in front of anybody. I would wait until everybody left the house before I did anything. I strictly started off with these super vulnerable, um, intense love ballads, you know, like Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston type stuff. Um, and then it slowly progressed into, okay, now I'm writing about my own personal struggles and vulnerabilities. I was getting bullied like horrible, horribly, so I would write songs about that. Um, write songs about overcoming the situation. And I think that's what led to who I am now. Katera comes from the hood. She was shunned at school. She felt safe nowhere. And the only place that kept her sane was behind the piano. So to see that and to see where she is now, mind blowing. I was a very, very shy, timid kid. For so many years, I had stayed voiceless. I stayed quiet. I never expressed myself in any kind of way. I loved singing. I loved harmonizing with people, but I never took the lead in anything. I always stayed in the background. And one day we had, it was eighth grade, um, and we had a black history program coming up. And they were like, um, you want to sign up to perform something? This is your chance. So I was like, you know what? I'm tired of like, <laughs> I'm tired of like hiding. Like, I want to see if I can actually do this. That was my first time performing in front of like at least a hundred plus people. I received my very first standing ovation from complete strangers. My mom was in the front crying because she had no idea that I had that in me. I didn't know either. You don't want to know how to set yourself free. Time to walk away. It was definitely a process and a journey of me just getting comfortable in my skin enough to put myself out there in front of people because this was songs that I was writing from the bottom of my soul. <laughs> and I was just putting it out there for strangers to just honestly judge and take it any kind of way they wanted. I 
have people come up to me and say how the song touched them on a spiritual, emotional, even physical level. And it's like, keep going, Katera, keep going. All that old energy, all that old trauma, we have to shed that. Documentarian Michael Martin has been following Katera's musical and personal journey as she continues to walk out of deep-rooted insecurity and make her mark in a male-dominated industry. She's one of the most sensitive people I've ever met, yet she's also someone that teaches me never to give up. No matter how she feels publicly, privately, she always finds a, a way to come back to herself and come back to her art. You know, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. For a long time, I never even considered myself a real musician. I had allowed people to tell me who I wasn't for so long that I believed in. Um, and it was all an illusion. I'm at 32 years old. And one thing I can say to kids, um, especially if you come from perceived nothingness, don't let anybody put a ceiling over your dreams. I tell specifically women, femmes, um, that are trying to pursue anything in a male-dominated industry, please be your number one coach, manager, business partner, and best friend, because it gets very nasty out here for women. Not afraid to be free. Go where I want, where I want to be. So many people tell women what they can and cannot do in these male-dominated industries and spaces. She's showing me, and I feel like her story of the, the life that she's living can show other people how to be soft and how to be strong at the exact same time. I had focused so much on stepping into my power and like kind of finding my voice that I didn't realize the aftermath of that, that you are gonna have people who were used to you being the person who you were before, and they are not gonna be comfortable with you stepping into this new form of power. Um, and it's nothing personal, it's just some people get very comfortable with your place in their life. As bigger opportunities begin to come her way, Katera remains focused on creating awareness around mental health issues, inequality, and poverty, obstacles she understands all too well. I really do have this vision to where I wanna rebuild Wilston. I wanna make sure kids don't go through what I went through. I do plan to bring that, the treasures or whatever I achieve back to my community. Can we fly? Next week, a visit to the Wainwright tomb at Bell Fountain Cemetery, plus the 10th anniversary of the Wednesday night jazz jam at the Dark Room. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.